John Gordon Sinclair. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Gordon comes to us hot foot from the Duke of York's Theatre in the West End of London, where he's currently giving his Jeeves and Jeeves and Worcester. And in fact, the production will be on tour to Glasgow on November the 24th to November the 29th. Yeah, I do my research, Gordon. <laughs> Very good. So, seats available on some parts, but book early to avoid disappointment, I'd say. <laughs> You know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, the world of Gussie Finknottle and Bertie Wooster and Stiffy Bing seems completely removed from the world which you create in your second novel, Blood Whispers. Now, I, must, I had this idea before I sat down to read the book, it would be a sort of quirky, comedic, light, thoughtful piece. And here, I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe the darkness, the amorality of it, the violence. And I thought, does mild-mannered John Gordon Singer go into his study, sit down at his computer and turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, <laughs> I like to spend my days plotting ways to kill people. Yes, <laughs> now I um, thought you were such a nice boy. It's a side too. of me you don't probably have, d didn't know about. No, but it came as quite, quite a surprise. Yeah, well I think, I think people's first impressions of me are from a film that I did. <laughs> Um, which which was it called shall again? not we shall not name <laughs> no. uh, about thirty years ago um, and uh, you know first impressions count so I think people tend to think that that's the guy I am mm -hmm. and I'm not denying that that's the guy I was but um, there's quite a, there's quite a few other I do quite a few other things yes yeah, <laughs> so from has it has this be gangly. <laughs> You know? Has life has embittered you? Has experience hardened you? Is that? Um, I don't know about embittered. Mm. I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't feel embittered in any way. Um, if that doesn't sound too bitter. Um, <laughs> but no. I, I, well, what, when I started writing, what I wanted to do was write the kind of book that I would want to take on holiday with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I like crime fiction, and I so I thought that that was a good place to start. Um, I also am kind of quite interested in politics as well, so there's, there's a lot of political content in the books as well. Um, I do like a laugh, so that, oh, mm -hmm. that hopefully there's a few funny bits as well, and I quite like a cry. And one of the things is when I've read all the crime novels that I've read have never made me cry. Um, and so I wanted to try and write something that would have uh, an emotional impact on people as well, so it wouldn't just be a, it wouldn't just be a kind of bog standard crime novel. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that's what I was aiming for. I'm not saying well, I, I achieved that, but that's yeah, what I was I trying to do. You succeeded admirably. But what made you want to write? Have you always been a kind of secret scribbler? <laughs> um, why are you laughing at that? Why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> it was a really awful laugh as well. It was like a. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like, like one of your characters. I know. Um, um, I haven't, I've always had ideas but mm. I, 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 that I've wanted to, I, that I've never really quite known what to do with. Um, and. For a while I thought I wanted to write f scripts and write film scripts and then uh, when the opportunity presented itself, it, ha it happened to coincide with me having my first child and I was being offered jobs that, I, that would take me away from home that I didn't really want to do. And I thought, well maybe now's the time to sit down and write this idea that, that I, I've had for quite a while. Maybe now's the time to do it. Um, and I thought, I, I started actually writing it as a film script and then I thought, well, if I could spend a couple of years doing this and then it would sit around someone's desk for a couple of years and I thought if it's going to be ignored I would rather it be ignored as a novel than a film script mm -hmm. so uh, that, that, that um, and also I thought if I write it as a novel then there's a chance it could be made into a film whereas the other way around it, it, it doesn't really generally work that way. Yes, I wondered about the, the sort of, have they snapped up the film rights or? I wouldn't say snapped up. <laughs> there's been some interest. Um, I think that I, he said bitterly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wouldn't say I, they've been snapped up. No, the closest I've come to it, and I only tell the story because I like dropping the names, that mm -hmm. a friend, I've got this friend of mine, Barney, I wouldn't say his second name actually because he's quite dodgy, um, <laughs> but he, d he deals with this guy, he does a lot of business with this guy in LA called Dice, which just, I mean that's dodgy in itself isn't it? Who, does anyone know anyone called Dice who isn't dodgy? And uh, he gets a mention in the first book, uh, th this guy, uh, this friend Barney of mine in 70 times 7, he gets a mention and um, he gave the book to Dice and Dice 
got on the plane and, and uh, to LA, back to LA, and read the book on the plane, and phoned Barney and said, he said, you know, I, I, I love this, I'm gonna give this to Jack, you know, I just think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so Barney phoned me up and said, you know, Jack's, he's, he's taking the book to Jack, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, right, who's Jack? <laughs> um, and, and he gave the book to Jack Nicholson, mm -hmm. and that's as close, <laughs> That's as clo and uh, see, that's, I like telling it because it's, it's name dropping. I, I, I apologise for that, mm -hmm. but I kind of don't actually. I just mm -hmm. wanted to drop the name. But so that's about as close as it's got. It's, it's come to. And did Jack movies. eventually? Pass I haven't on heard it? anything since. Right. <laughs> so he obviously didn't enjoy it. But um, was it? I mean, did you? Was it sort of hanging around? Uh, Winnie Bagos all day, or was it you know, working in the theatre with sort of long gaps between the mat and the evening performance? When was it you started to actually the process of writing? It wasn't Winnie Bagos, and it wasn't long gaps in the theatre. It was long gaps between changing nappies and fixing bottles. <laughs> that that, uh, that mm -hmm. and that's the truth of the matter. Um, because I wanted to be at home, I, I didn't want to be one of these dads that people, they always say, oh, kids when they grow up say, oh, my dad was never there, you know, so I didn't want to be that, uh, that dad. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought it was important to spend, especially the first two or three years, uh, you know, hands on and getting stuck in there. And in between times, I th uh, um, in order to do that, I had to kind of be at home, mm -hmm. really. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be at home, then I'll, I, I should start trying to write. And at first, when I started it, I thought, if I, I did, if I wasn't able to do a full day of it, I, I get dispirited quite quickly because I thought if I can't do a full day of this, then maybe I, that maybe this is the wrong thing to be doing. But then I learned quite quickly that when you've got young kids, a full day of anything doesn't exist. Yes, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> ap apart from nappies and mm. and, and uh, you know making bottles. And, and so I learned, and it was a great thing, because I learned, to, to, one, to be able to write anywhere. I, didn't, I don't have to have a special place to go, really, although I do now have a special mm -hmm. place to go. But, um, and also, if, even if I could spend half an hour working on it, at least it was moving forward. And, you know, you get to the end of a month and you might have done 10 hours, maybe, work mm -hmm. on it, but it, it's moving forward all the time. Um, and then eventually it gets to a kind of critical mass where it, it, it takes on its own life and starts to, to, to write itself. I mean, um, was acting satisfying you as much as it did before? Is this a kind of reflection on maybe you want to explore other sides of your creativity, your creative personality? Well, the thing, I, I, have, a, I have a very strange relationship with acting. I don't, I, I, I kind of feel and I need to talk to someone about this. I feel mildly insulted if someone calls me an actor. <laughs> I know, I, it's a, a strange thing. I don't, I don't actually get an awful lot out of it. I don't enjoy it really that much. And it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing to admit to. I've, I've never been comfortable with it. I've never really... In, uh, um, I quite enjoy the process of, of learning a script and, you know, getting on stage, k kind of. But I, I, it makes me very uncomfortable. I don't enjoy it at all. And when I found, when I actually mm. sat down and, and started writing, I suddenly found something that I wanted to do. Mm. Um, so which at 50 is kind of a bit late. <laughs> I'm a bit of a late starter. But um, what is it about acting that you feel uneasy or uncomfortable about calling yourself um, an actor? I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't like mm. discussing the process. I don't mm. like, you know, when I hear actors talking about it, I kind of switch the telly off. I'm just, I'm not interested in that side of things. When I read a script, I read it, I, I look at it, if it's meant to be funny, I think, can I make people mm. laugh doing that? Or if it's meant to be sad, I think, can I make people cry when I'm doing that? And that's the, the rule I apply to it, really. And aside from that, I don't, I don't do research into it and all that. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not that interested in the process mm -hmm. of acting. Really? Well, I suppose it's, it's terrible very admission. I'm talking <laughs> to myself. Oh, well, there's easy. no directors in tonight. Saying, well, I'm not going to approach him now. I was, say, I was going to offer him a part in that, weren't yeah. I? But I suppose it's hard sometimes to. It's difficult to describe acting, isn't it, without sounding terribly pretentious and precious. And maybe that's one that makes you feel uncomfortable because it's such a personal. Every actor will regard the way he or she goes about it in a very different way I would have thought. Yeah, I, 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 I hate having discussions about it. Mm. Right? But, <laughs> I, and, and rehearsals and stuff like that and they start mm -hmm. saying what do you think your motivation is? I think well I'm, the motivation is you've employed me and you're going to pay yeah. me and <laughs> I'm going to stand on a stage and say it. You know, I'm, I feel quite motivated by well, that. Um, as no that card, enough? As no card <laughs> said, we open Monday. Yeah. That's all the motivation he wanted. Yeah, I, I'm not, mm. I, um, I find it all quite, and, and also the, the thing I don't enjoy the, 
I, I'm not interested in the, in the attention and stuff like that, mm -hmm. really. It's a weird thing to be sitting here saying that. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I, uh, I just don't get an awful lot out of it, really, to be honest. But you're enjoying Jeeves and Worcester at the moment, you were saying. Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> <laughs> So this, is the dilemma. this is the dilemma. This is the dilemma of it. There, there are moments when it's great fun, mm -hmm. and that's the thing. It, it's, it, it's, it's everything around it that I don't like. Mm. You know, the actual when you're actually on stage and you're and you're doing the performance, then that's kind of, that's kind of vaguely mm. enjoyable. But everything else around it, <laughs> I don't enjoy. I don't enjoy the the you know. The, well, there's lots of it I don't enjoy. <laughs> And um, one thing you didn't enjoy either, you were telling me, was actually reading from your book when you came a couple of years ago. Why was that? Why did you not enjoy well, it, that? Well, I'd been, I'd asked because a lot of people had said, "Do um, will uh, you'll be expected to read something from from the book?" And I and I thought, well, okay, that's fine. And I said to my publishers because this like, two years ago, this was the first event that I did was the Edinburgh Festival. Um, to do with the book, to do with 70 times 7. And so I phoned the publishers and said, well, I'd be expected to read. And they were saying, no, it'll be you don't have to. No, you, you definitely don't. And of course, I arrived here and someone said, the first thing they said to me is, what passage are you reading? <laughs> I said, oh, I, I, I hadn't prepared it, really. Mm -hmm. I hadn't. And they said, well, you're an actor. It'll be fine. You just stand up and read a passage from, from the, the thing. So I started to panic slightly um, because I thought, well, I haven't really prepared it. And, uh, I, as I started to read it, I realised, and it struck me, it was like a thunderbolt, it struck me that this, the book was not written in my voice. Mm. And I, I, it only occurred to me right at that very moment that, that it was written in, in, a, in, in someone else's voice. And so I found it very difficult to do. I found it a very hard thing to do. Well, you could say it was written in a lot of different characters' voices. Well, there's lots of different characters, but the author's voice, the mm -hmm. author's the voice it was not voice. mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was not mine. The narrator. And I had an incident, actually, with Edie Stark, because I recorded a, a, an interview with her for, for Blood Whispers. And um, it was a similar, I said, well, you check that I don't have to read anything from it. Mm -hmm. We can just chat about it. And again, it came back saying, no, it's fine, you don't have to. And Edie arrived with the book, and she said, would you mind reading a passage? <laughs> I said, well, I, I'm not sure that I should really because I, I haven't prepared it. And she said, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Just choose a, choose a chapter or a, a passage to read. Mm -hmm. and, and so I kind of flicked through it and, and chose one. And I read it. And at the end of it, she said, is there another passage you could get? <laughs> <laughs> Well, funny um, you should say that, Gwen, because it's good enough for Edie Stark, it's good enough for me. <laughs> no, don't worry. <laughs> but, um, and I said, no, I, I don't know what to do. And she, said, <laughs> and she said, maybe you could try lifting your head. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I told you it was shit. I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> I told you I can't do it. But do um, you read it out once you've written your, perhaps you've been working away a couple of pages that you've done that day, do you read them Obviously, you read them to yourself. Do you read them aloud to hear the kind of musicality? I of read it? the dialogue to myself. Mm -hmm. I, I speak to myself. Um, and I was quite relieved that a couple of years ago, was it two years ago, the 200th anniversary uh, um, of uh, Dickens? Was it 200 years ago? Was it last year? Yes, or the year no, 2012. 2012. Um, and I was quite relieved to, because the, the, obviously they were discussing old Dickens' work and stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he used to do was stand up in front of the mirror mm -hmm. and, and speak the dialogue to himself. And I was so relieved to hear that because there was quite a few times I'd be standing. You know, talking to myself in the mirror, thinking, this is weird. <laughs> this is very strange. So I was quite relieved that he did that as well. Well, Dickens was a much more enthusiastic, enthusiastic actor than you were. Is that ah, right? Was yes, where well, you would go on. Yeah. He, he died just after he'd given the death of Nancy somewhere or other. Right. And he got so excited by it, he actually, you know, collapsed. Right. Not long after. Oh, God. <laughs> so mind how you go I've with that. I've got to go on tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about this blood whispers. Tell us about the sort of genesis of how did, how did this come about? Well, the, the, when I had finished the first book, I knew that the story wasn't, wasn't uh, complete, really. And um, I wanted to continue the story, take the story forward, but I don't know if, you, if, you, I don't know if you've read the first book, but it, it, it was quite difficult to continue with the way it ended. <laughs> Um, and there's, there was a character in it, a young girl called Neve Maguire, who was eight years old. The first book was set in the early 90s um, in, in Alabama and in Northern Ireland. And um, she, the second book, the, the, the Blood Whispers, is set in the present day. So she was eight years old in the first book. And um, 
I, 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 was, I wanted to find a way of continuing the story, and I thought her character, because of what happens to her in the first book, she's a fairly minor character in the first book, but because of what happens to her, I thought it would be, that would be a great way to carry the story forward, and also because of what's happened to her, to have quite a complex character to, to put into these situations. Um, and also, this, this, the, the second book is set in Glasgow as well, which, which wasn't... Um, she leaves Northern Ireland at the, year, at the age of eight years old with her mother and her grandmother, and they're, they're, they're trying to escape their past, they're trying to escape what happened to them there. And I, I, was, I was thinking, well, if they moved somewhere, they're coming to the mainland, if they're moving down south, then everywhere they would go, people would say, oh, you're from Ireland, what, where are you from? And they would stick out. Whereas they've came, because the connections between the West Coast and Northern Ireland are still very strong, they, wouldn't, they would blend in a lot more easily mm -hmm. here. So that was the, 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 the main reason that I, I thought, well, it would be, that Glasgow would be a great place to do that. And also, a lot, of, a lot of the times I walk around Glasgow, I think it's, it's I, I, when I'm walking around, I think it'd be great film here, it'd be great to set, there's so, some great kind of uh, film sets, mm. really, I thought it'd be great to, to base some of it in there. So although that's not what the book's about, that's the kind of background mm. to why. Um, and the certainly, look at, I mean, your sense of location is very strong. So have you, have you do you envision, do you visualise the, the streets that you've chosen in Glasgow or anywhere else, in fact, to set the, the plot? Um, well, yeah. Well, the thing is, when I'm, I find when I'm writing, I, all I'm trying to do is describe the film that I've got going on in my head. That's that's, and and when I think about it, I, I always think in filmic terms. Mm -hmm. I think, how would this look on a, on a movie it's screen? screen. Um, and and even to the point where you might have heard this before, but when I talk to my editor, I, I keep describing things as I say, you know, in scene such and such, mm -hmm. you think this should happen, and she said, "You mean chapter?" And I think, "Oh yes, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I do mean chapter." I'm sorry. I I, 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 I even talk in kind of filmic terms mm -hmm. when I'm, I'm talking about it. And I've got a friend that's with me tonight. Uh, um, this guy Matt Forrest, who's a commercials director, mm -hmm. um, and. He, he, he can tell the most amazing stories in 30 seconds, the most complex and fantastic, de fantastically detailed stories in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. and, and so if I'm working my way through a chapter scene, um, <laughs> act, act, <laughs> whatever it is, um, I, off, I, I, I quite often keep Matt in mind because I think mm -hmm. if I, would, would, it would, what would Matt do? Would he cut away from this mm -hmm. or would he continue on this? Or, and, and, so when I'm writing the book I'm th and I'm editing the book, I think, uh, is this idea played out now? Should I move on to a different idea? Mm -hmm. And so I th I'm thinking in those terms all the time. I mean, did you take yourself off to say Robert, uh, you know, the, the great script doctor, McKee, McGee, or Reed Sidfield, or any of the other sort of gurus of writing screenplays, or did you keep well clear of all that and rely on your own No, I think, I think, um, no, keep well clear of it. And I've, I've, I've heard a lot of um, writers say that they don't read fiction when they're writing. Mm -hmm. And I completely get that now because you kind of tend to be influenced by that. And even, because uh, I like painting as well, and I don't, but I don't like to look at other artists because I, th I want what, what comes from within me to be uh, not as pure as possible, but as, I, so I'm not, I can't be accused of plagiarism because I think, well, that, no, that, that was my idea. It might be similar to someone else's idea, but it, well, I had that, you know, Well, I think the trouble with it, if you read all these books, you kind of, it becomes formulaic that everybody writes and arcs and three acts and resolutions and they, these are the sort of, you know, terms that everyone uses and so they all write the same screenplay basically and yeah originality is you know it doesn't always guarantee well they always say that you should write about what you know but mm -hmm. i think that's wrong i think you should write about what you don't know because well, i jolly well hope so looking at some of the stuff <laughs> well <happens>. yeah <laughs> and there's quite a lot i don't know about that As um but i i do because i think you bring a different perspective to it you bring a fresh perspective mm -hmm. to something that that if, if you if you know about it, then you're kind of just regurgitating stuff you, you, you already know. But it was more interesting to look at things uh, differently. So in a way, it was unfinished business. You wanted to go back to the character, Neve, and bring her on to the, the next stage. What else did you... I mean, it was interesting. Did you, why did you choose a female character as a sort of central figure in the book? Um, well, because she was female in the first book. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have sorry. had a sex That was a cheap change. gag, I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> you could have done a sort of 
no, Wachowski I thought it, brother. It, no, sister. it was it was the the, the 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 gender was never an issue for mm. me really. I, I, I never really th I, I just thought she was a fantastic. Well, because of what's happened to her, it, she's a great character and she can be really complex. And and the, the, there was very few times throughout the book where I thought, what would a female say in a situation mm. like this? Always, I was thinking, what would someone? Because she's been quite damaged. She's very. She's become a lawyer. She's a criminal lawyer, and, and her the the urge in her to help people is very very strong. Because, as I say, what happened to her when, when she was younger, and um, so I was thinking, what, what would a a damaged character who's empathetic and and you know feels the strong urge to help people? What would that a character like that do in a situation like mm. this? But I, it, it never crossed my mind. What would a female in a situation like that? do in a situation like this. So you feel quite comfortable in then creating characters who are very different from you and have different voices from yours. That seems to, seems to be something you've done relatively easily or naturally? Yeah, I th well, uh, yeah, it seems to come mm. kind of reasonably easily. I always, because I've played, I've played big parts in small movies and I've played small parts in big movies, so I know what it's like to be the, 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 you know, the small part in a big movie. And so all, my, all the characters, again, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'd, it, I'd hope that you would be able to take any one of these characters out and write a book about them. Mm -hmm. So even the, even the minor characters get, get, get the best lines and the, the best descriptions and, and, and stuff like that. Because I mean, how much research do, uh, did you do? I mean, I'm interested in Albanian, East European prostitution. Did you research that with I can't discuss tension? that. The, the court case is in a few months. <laughs> okay. um, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, well, no, it's all it's all there on the, the on the the web. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was trying to I was trying to um, I, I was trying to come up with a scenario where. Uh, of how drugs, heroin and stuff like that were getting into Scotland, were, were coming in and what the route it was taking. And when I started researching that, um, I, I, I started to find out about how the CIA were funding the, the route, the heroin route through uh, Europe and you know from Asia through Europe and into the States and, and were actually Although they weren't actively involved in actually picking the drug, drugs up, they were facilitating the, the transport of these drugs to make it cheaper on the streets so that people would buy their drug, that those drugs, rather than buy the, the heroin from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And thus, and therefore, they would undermine the, the, the price of mm -hmm. drugs in Afghanistan and by default undermine the war effort. In, Afghanistan, and and you start reading into these things, you think this is just crazy. You know, you couldn't make you couldn't make that up. Um, and through that, a lot of it had to do with the the Serbians and Kosovoans and coming through there. And because of the the wars that were going on over there, a lot of the a lot of the like the, the drugs that are now the gangs that operate the drug cartels and stuff like that come from those countries. Um, and they're battle hardened because they've fought wars. They do, I, read this, I read this interview with a, a drug dealer who was saying, we hate having to deal with Serbians because, you know, when it was the Italians and the other guys, it was fine, you could talk to them. But these guys mm. just, just fight. And, and you know, and there, was, there was this kind of honour amongst thieves thinking it's ridiculous, you know, we have to fight over about the drugs rather than have a conversation about it. Um, Tell me about your dialogue. It's very pared down. It's very spare. Uh, was this something you deliberately set out to do to kind of reduce it to its sort of what needs to be said and leave out kind of adjectives, adverbs, flowery? I, I'm trying to metaphors. do it the way. Well, yeah, I'm not good at all. That. I'm not good at metaphors and stuff like that. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, uh, to 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 write the dialogue as you as mm -hmm. we would speak as it would be spoken, really. And also, I've got a name eventually one day to write a book that's all dialogue. I'd like it to be because the descriptive passages for me. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading a book, I was like, oh god, I don't know. <laughs> okay, just uh, get, get, tell me what's going on. You know, let me hear some conversation. And I'd love to be able to tell a whole story just through dialogue, because I think you can, you know, you don't have to set the scene every time, you know, be kind of interesting. Because I do think actors have got an inst almost instinctive understanding of dialogue. I mean, maybe it's because you, you know when something doesn't work, because you're perhaps some of the lines you're presented with aren't always the best, and you seem to, actors seem to have a kind of sixth sense of what works. I mean, did you, do you think that, being an actor has helped you with the dialogue? 
Are you calling me an actor? <laughs> <laughs> Damn! Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, I think, do you have a, do you think actors have a, would you agree with a... I think, I, I'm, I'm, not so really sure, I'm not so sure if it's more uh, about being an actor as, as uh, uh, growing up in Glasgow, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, it's more mm. to do with that, really, I think. You know, you have an inbuilt, you know, an instinct for, and the timing of things is, is quite specific. You find it in New York as well, that, mm. that, that, that there's a, a kind of rhythm to the way people speak mm. that just seems to work. And there's a sort of love of language as well, isn't I mean, that sounds rather kind of pretentious, but there's an enjoyment of verbal dexterity and verbal... Yeah, I, always, I still quite like the wise guy, you know, I, mm -hmm. I quite like that, and the Raymond Chandler kind of, you know, I've kind of got that going on in my head as well. I, I like those kind of, sort of, what, the wise guy remarks. Well, there's quite a bit of it in there, and you, you seem to have a good ear too for the American characters as well. Well, that's just, that's been brought up in Starsky and Hutch. You know, <laughs> you know it's, been, it's been kind of inbred into me since I was a kid. Really. What about the plotting? Because it's very labyrinthine, very Byzantine. You have to kind of, you can't skip through the description because you, you'll miss a sort of important plot point or something. Was this something you enjoyed putting together? Yeah, I, I, I was, it, it came a lot more easily in the second mm. book. In the first book, I ran into all sorts of problems because, because I, I, I when I sit down to write, I don't plan it out really. I just I think, well, that's a good idea, and I write it, and then think, well, where would that slot in? Um, and when we were pretty close to finishing the first book, the the and we sent it off to the first proofreader, they came back saying that you know you've got a guy walking in to a bar in Alabama who's just left a bar in New in, in uh, you know Newry in Northern yeah. Ireland. So how does that work? And and the the the. So the thread through that was a very difficult one to... We had to make a lot of changes at the last minute. There was a big rewrite happened. But with the second one, I was a bit more disciplined about thinking, OK, it's much more linear, the, the mm. second book, than the first one. Mm. I'm sorry about the rain, by the way. It's all right. It happens to me everywhere I go. I'm jinxed. <laughs> I, I arrived up from, from, from uh, London this morning and, and I, I had to get up at six o'clock and uh, boo-hoo and, uh, and I checked into the hotel and I, went, I, I, I lay down in the bed and fell asleep and the fire alarm went off <laughs> and we were all evacuated and, a fire, and a fire, the fire brigade appeared. I wish I'd put my trousers on. <laughs> I didn't have time. Too late, no. I actually lay there mm -hmm. thinking, should I just burn? <laughs> I, I did. I, I'm just kind of, I'm so tired. I just let whatever happened, happen. What about when you're writing this particular type of, uh, uh, I suppose you would call it a crime thriller, a police, a police, but not really a police, it's more a kind of... Uh, thriller will do. I think thriller, yeah, because the crime thing is not so much what it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't focus so much on the crime as such. So, did you find it? Were you, did you enjoy preparing surprises? Do you like to surprise the reader? Do you like to kind of pull the wool over their eyes or the rug from under their feet or whatever? Do, do, or do you like to? I mean, what's the? Do you have a sort of idea of your perfect reader? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have an idea of the reader, but I. I, I I, I do like. I used to read a lot of Dickens, and I used to love the fact that you know the character who appeared in the first chapter and you don't hear about again mm. suddenly appears in the last chapter. And you think, oh, of course that was. So I like I like that kind of, I like this that, that kind of structure where the surprises. But it's like because the, the first book, a lot of the comments were to do with the violence in the first mm -hmm. book, which um, uh, which I sort of accept, but. But I treat the, 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 the humour and the p politics and the violence are all treated with the same... But my, my thing is that if it's meant to be funny, then I want you to laugh. Mm -hmm. And if it's meant to be sad, then I want you to cry. And if it's meant to be violent, I want you to go, actually... I, I don't want you to think, oh, this is oh, great, it's violence. I want you to go, oh, God, that's, that's horrible. Because that's, that's the impact violence mm -hmm. has on you, you know? And now you're concerned to, to excite and make the thrill, actually. It's a thriller, so the reader, the reader should be thrilled. That's your aim, presumably. Yeah, but not through the violence. I want them to be thrilled with the story and, mm -hmm. and with things that you th you, you're led down one path and think, actually, that's not how, you know, that, oh, that's not how it worked out. Okay. I, I do like those kind of surprises. Because sometimes when I'm reading, uh, not your book, but sort of, well, James Patterson, that kind of uh, writing, there's almost a sort of sadistic relish sometimes 
in some of the violence in these books. So it's just yeah, I don't, get, I don't get that. Enjoyment no, I, no I, I have images, and again, uh, uh, apologies if you've heard me say this before, but I have images in my head. I remember seeing uh, the Viet Cong prisoner being shot in the head mm -hmm. on, as a newsreel footage, and it stuck with me, and it's, it's seared into my brain. I remember seeing uh, you know, a Palestinian prisoner getting beaten up, and, and, and when you see real violence, the impact it has on you as a human being is far, far greater than anything you see in the movies or, or anything you kind of read in books. And I read, um, I, I read a, a, a Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. I was reading that at the same time I was writing the first book. Mm -hmm. and, and it's unremittingly violent. It's horrible it, to the point I got halfway through it and I thought, I'm, I'm, I can't finish this book, it's too much. And I don't understand why he's done this actually because it's just, there's, no, there's nothing in it that makes mm -hmm. you want to finish reading it. It's just so horrible. And then I read an interview with him where he said he wanted to get, uh, he wanted to write a book that wasn't from the movie, you know, the kind of violence you see in movies and the kind of violence you see in the television, but got much closer to the impact that real violence has on you as a human being. Um, and when I read that, I thought, well, that's the, that, that, that's exactly what I want to do. I want, uh, I don't want it to be sensationalist. I want it to be kind of, you think, actually. That's horrible. And if you're writing crime novels, then the, you, the, you know the situation you're in. Uh, the, these these situations do happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in a way, do you think the writer has a bit of extra responsibility in the use of violence that he or she puts into the book? Um, well, I don't. I, I can't mm -hmm. speak for other writers, mm -hmm. but for me, uh, the, there is there is a, a side of it that I. I that, that's kind of what I'm aiming at. But as I say, we're focusing more on the violence, but it's the same with the humour, uh, uh, the same thing. I think if I, I write a line that I, is supposed to be funny, then I want you to laugh at it. Um, Are you a disciplined writer? Do you, do you make sure you do your 500 words a day, despite the nappy changing and the bottle and what have you? And all the 500 words a day? Really? Yes. Is that how much you're supposed to do? I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like a good number. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm not really at all. And again, because if it's moving forward, then that's, even if it's 100 words, mm. it, it, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's moving forward. Uh, but I'm not disciplined. I have now got a hut, I call it the Roald Dahl Social Club, which is, uh, uh, and, uh, because I've got a little hut at the bottom, it's quite a big hut actually, at the bottom of the garden um, that I go to to write, which has actually turned out to be a tactical error, um, mm. because if you're at home, then it's the, the perception is you're at home, and so you're still available to hang out the washing, mm -hmm. and uh, you're not actually at work. Really? Have you like, explained to your nearest and dearest that you're writing literature and you know, I can't be bothered with these domestic tasks? Well, yeah, mm. it doesn't. The thing is, because writing does look like, mm. like just. <laughs> well, I don't. It, it, I mean, all, all writing looks like is this. <laughs> There's very little of that. It's mostly just that, um, and so it doesn't look like you're doing very much. I um, mean, do you get days when you're sort of blocked and nothing much comes, nothing much happens? Um, How do you get over that? Generally not. I think there's, there's, there's just so many ideas out mm. there. You know, if you click onto Wikipedia and on any subject, you're, they just instantly start sparking off ideas, mm. you know, or Google anything. Mm -hmm. it's, there's so much out there um, that I don't really... But what I do like, I, I love getting... What I have learned, one of the tricks I have learned, is if you have an idea in your head, get it onto a bit of paper. It doesn't exist otherwise. And once it does exist, it's like throwing a pot. Once it's on there, you can start shaping it and doing things to it. But when, you're in your, when it's in your head, you can't edit, you can't edit it, really. I mean, would you agree it's better to get something down on paper or on the screen or whatever it is, whether you actually that reigns in a finished novel or short story, whatever it is you're doing, just to have something there? Definitely. I mean, mm. most of the stuff, the first, the first throw is never the way it turns out, but at least it's out of your head and it's an idea that exists then. And, 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 and then what I tend to do is leave it and come back to it and, and with a li little bit of space, a little bit of time, you come back to it and think, actually, that, was not, that wasn't a great idea at all. Or there might be something in there you think, well, actually, I can develop that and mm -hmm. make more of it. I mean, did you have any models in mind, favourite writers that you uh, are influenced by in your work? Well, I, I, I talk about Elmore Leonard a lot, yeah. but only because I've read a lot of Elmore Leonard. And, and I like, I mean, you know, anyone that he... he one of his rules for writing is if it reads like writing, he rewrites it. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone that comes up with that idea has got to be good. Um, and I, I, again, I like the way he uses dialogue a lot um, as, as well. But what I, more so with the first book, if I was ever stuck, I would just pick up a, a, an Elmore Leonard and mm -hmm. flick through and think, all oh, right, that's, 
it gave me a clue into doing the next bit. But I didn't do that with the second one. I, I, I want to kind of develop my own. Sort I mean, of way do you have a sort of law of, of good dialogue? What constitutes good dialogue? What should dialogue do? No, I don't know. I don't know. You do not it's, think it's got to law. work as long as it works. <laughs> you know, that's the main thing. One of the weird things I found um, that the, the the and this is a really strange thing when I when I, like there was a, a passage that happens in the book that happens in um, uh, the cathedral, Glasgow Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's a punchline. And as I wrote it, I burst out laughing. And I thought, that's a weird thing to do to yourself, to make yourself laugh. It's a really, you know, when you actually, you know the line, you're just about to write it, and then you burst out laughing. Mm. It's a very strange, it's a lovely thing to happen, but it's a very strange thing. Well, I suppose it's good to be your own most generous critic in a way. Well, mm. it's just a very, it's a, and also when you write something sad and you're sitting there crying, you think, what is going on? You know, that is a, that's a very odd thing to happen. We'll leave that to the, the psychiatrist in here then. Yeah. Did you keep it a secret when you were writing your first books? I mean, it's often said two actors meet and one says, you know, what are you doing? I'm writing a screenplay. And the other one says, well, neither am I. Yeah. <laughs> So did I, you keep it a secret? I didn't. I didn't so much keep it a secret, but what I, I what I didn't do, what I didn't want to be, is one of those people who said, "Oh, I'm writing a book." Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, it wasn't so much that I kept it a secret. I just didn't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> can you? Is there? Can you distinguish between the two of those? And so you have now got ideas and plots. You know, down the line? I have, yeah. There's the third book which will hopefully finish off the... I see the first book as The Hobbit and the <laughs> next two books. Uh, it should be three, but I'm, I'll stick to two. Um, <laughs> yeah. As the, the rest of The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I... There is an idea for the third book which will con continue the story of this one um, and hopefully resolve s some lines from the, the first book as well. Correct um, me if I'm wrong, but I couldn't see you having created a character who would be ripe to be played by John Gordon Sinclair in the film versions of your novels. Was this, is there somebody there that you would like to play or would you have nothing to do with her? I would have nothing to do with mm. her, but um, Angela, Angelina Jolie can play it. Yes. She can play any part she likes. Well, I gather, she's, um, I gather she's quite interested, but you yeah. haven't been returning her calls. I haven't, I know, I've been mm. blanking her. <laughs> um, but no, 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 not, no, not really. Not, not anything I would want to do. But I, the, 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 just to finish off on the, the third book, mm -hmm. the, I, I, I the, at the end of the second book, there are definitely some storylines that aren't tied off, that they're not finished off. Um, and there's a character that appears at the very end that, that is, is not really explained, um, which will be explained in the third, mm -hmm. the third novel. But when I sent it into the publishers, when I sent it into Faber and Faber, I, it was, I, I thought if I hear back from them um, saying you've got to tie up these, these loose ends, because I only had a two book deal, if you've got to tie up these loose ends, <laughs> exactly. then I thought then I know that I'm not getting a third book. <laughs> um, and thankfully the phone didn't ring. So, uh, uh, so is the fact that you've published these two books, you, has it given you more satisfaction than anything else you've... More than anything I've ever yes. done. Yes. Absolutely, 100%. Including yeah. something with six letters beginning with A. Yeah, no, with, without a doubt. And the first, the, the, in fact, when I, I came here for the first time two years ago, when they handed me over the little plaque, the little uh, tabard, or what did you call it? Lanyard. Call it? Lanyard, lanyard yeah, tabard, yeah. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, <coughs> the lanyard they gave me, I, mm -hmm. that, I, 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 I've, I felt very good about that. I must be honest. Because how do you compare, I mean, you move in show business worlds and literary worlds. I mean, are they very different or quite similar in some way? Um, well, I, I think the first time, the first, because nobody would read the book the first time round, a lot of the questions were to do with a film that I made. Um, <laughs> yes, what was that film yeah, called again? It's escaped me. <laughs> um, whereas this time round, people are more interested in the books mm. and about talking about the book, which is great, which is, a, which is, which is a, a great thing. Because in a way, a lot of authors now have to do this sort of thing because it's expected of them, and some are better than others at doing it. But you're coming in the opposite direction of being a professional on the stage moving into writing as well so well the thing is for me this is what it's all about when mm. you write a book you don't write it for yourself you write it for people to read and and so the the, the 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 what the thing that i look forward to the most is sitting down with people and talking about it i feel almost i feel a bit embarrassed when i because i send it to people and i'm dying for them to come back not to, i don't want them to come back and say what's the best thing i've ever read mm. i'm not looking for that but i want to have a conversation mm. about it and and see what bits they liked and what bits they didn't like and what bits worked and what didn't and, and 
have a conversation about it. How is, how is your profession taking it? Because we're terrible. Uh, we like to compartmentalise people in this country. You, if you're an actor, you can't do anything else. If you're a writer, you can't do anything else. Or so they say. So as, as the business, do you think looking at you as slightly askance? Uh, well, I think so. I've been told this all my life. I started out um, life as an, an apprentice electrician, mm. and when a certain film came mm -hmm. along and I was asked to do it, they said, "Well, he can't. He can't do that because he's a he's an electrician." Um, and uh, I'm going to blow my own trumpet a bit here, but I get nominated for a BAFTA for that. Mm -hmm. And then I was offered a, a musical, and they said, well, he's a film actor, he shouldn't be doing musicals, and, and I, I, I won an award for that as well. Yeah. I'm, not just, I'm not just going to list all my awards. <laughs> what, what, the point I'm trying to make is that people keep saying to me, oh, you shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. that because you're not that. And I think, well, why? Mm -hmm. who, says who? You, you can do anything. I think people are capable of doing anything they set their mind to. Maybe not singing all the time, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's one thing I would draw the line at. But, well, that, um, people tend to think, oh, well, if he's a writer now, he won't be interested in doing this film or doing this play. Sometimes it, people find it hard to kind of, put, they put a tag on you and they expect that label to say the same thing, don't they? Yeah, I think that does happen, but I do it myself, you know, I mm. do it to people, I think, why are they doing that? That's a bit, a, a bit odd. Um, so but I, I just I, I think people are cap far, capable of far more, and, and the, the thing about it is the only difference between me and someone wanting to write a book is that I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and, and by that I mean if you want to write a book, sit down and do it. You know, don't talk about it. Just sit down and do it. Do you think mm -hmm. you'll go away from the thriller format? Do you think you might I don't know write historical fiction or literary novels or no, definitely not literary <laughs> novels. No, that's drawing the line. No, I, I'm, I'd quite happily stick with with the the crime fiction. I've got an idea for a, a not a well, it's a children's book, but a kind of older children's book that I, I want to do. I've, again, I've been thinking about it for years, but I'm now going to start working on it in the background. Um, but, but no, I want to stick with this. Really. Do you think eventually the acting might give way altogether to a hundred percent? At the moment, it's kind of fifty-fifty. But it, ultimately, I would love to just be mm -hmm. writing books. Well, we better go and see Jeeves and Worcester again. Just to, <laughs> it could be the last sighting. It could be, and it was very list. close. It was a very close. It was almost the. It was. Yeah. It was uh, within a hair's breadth. I was going to turn it down. Oh, dear. Well, um, I would. I would urge you to reconsider. Uh, going well, well, no. You'd deprive us of a great deal of pleasure if you did that. Well, I mean, different sorts of pleasure. That. But for that, um, you know, work in that, whatever that film was called again, uh, Georgie Girl, wasn't That's the it? one, Something yeah. Like <laughs> anyway, it's high time I piped down, and I think we need some questions and comments and observations from our lovely audience and the fine Edinburgh audience. I can see a hand up already, so where's the microphone, microphone person? Would you like to keep your hand up? There we are. I'd like to pass. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Hello there. I'm not going to mention that film, okay. but I would like to say that I thought your appearance in Local Hero was spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just wondered if the new Doctor Who um, actually sampled any of the whiskies behind the bar that he was in. Uh, well, do you know the thing about it is, I, have you seen the photographs of him, uh, of the new Doctor Who and what he's wearing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I had to take a second look there. The only difference in. is his lining is red. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was looking at it, I was thinking, Capaldi, I'm going to chin you the next time I see you. <laughs> that, I, and I, I've, I've got photographic evidence because I wore this the last time I was here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was quite surprised when I saw that. Um, is is it okay? On? No, it's okay. Um, as a writer myself, um, you have started to write uh, crime novels and then you talked about your uh, children's. Yeah. Would it be picture books or middle grade or young adult? or No, young adult, thinking? really. Yeah. yeah. My kids, my, my, my girls are six and eight and my, my eight-year-old has read, and I'm not, uh, this is a God's honest truth, she's read more books than I have in my whole life, and that's that, uh, uh, which is extraordinary. So, uh, and to my shame, I actually started to quit. I, because she'd put a book down and say, I'm going to start another book. And I'm thinking, there's no way you've read that. And so I would ask her questions. I doubted her. I would say, well, OK, what, you know, what happens when the elephant leaves the room? So well, it's great because it goes up. And I'm thinking, she has actually read them. <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing. So I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm figuring that by the time I've actually written it, they'll be at that age uh, um, where, they, where they, they'll read it. Um, if you ha Sorry, can I just ask another yeah, question? Yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Come on, stage. If you <laughs> no, no. Um, if you were to have a film made about yourself, who would you like to play you? Angelina Jolie. 
<laughs> Apart from her. <laughs> Apart from Angela. Apart from Angela. <laughs> Do you know? I don't know if she's got Is the same legs as you, but you know. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I, the, 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 the first book, the reason I started, I was going to write, a, 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 I keep being mistaken, not mistaken, but yeah, mistaken for uh, Tim Robbins. And the first idea I had was to write a film that, that for the two of us about kind of mistaken identity, which is where the, the idea for the first book came from. When I started writing it as a novel, it, it kind of fell by the wayside. But I've had lots of things happen in my life where people have thought I was Tim Robbins. So I might get him to do it. <laughs> Not by Susan Sarandon, presumably. Not by Susan Sarandon. No, I tried that, but she, <laughs> she threw she me out. through you. No, I had, I, I, I don't, you, you might have heard this story, but I, I, it happened to me in a lift in New York when I was standing. And you know when you become aware that someone's looking at you? I was going up in this lift and I, I, I was just aware of these eyes on me. And I kind of t turned around and looked and in the Glasgow way, kind of like, you know? <laughs> Who are you looking at? And he said, oh, are you him? I said, well, I don't know. Who do you think I am? And he said, oh, God, you're not. And I said, well, who did you think I was? And I said, Tim Robbins. And then I went to, I did a film with him called Eric the Viking, and I took my parents along to the, to the, the uh, premiere of it. And about 10 minutes in, my mum nudged me and said, you told me you were hardly in this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I, thought, I said, I haven't even been on yet. And she said, well, who's that? Tim Robbins. You know? So, uh, that's where they are. So I'll probably get him to do it. Anyway, well, you'll have to give the microphone back now, I'm afraid. <laughs> now, some more questions. Ah, a hand being waved at that, at that end. Sorry, this is not very uh, amusing like the last one, but in both of your books, you've got real stepping stones from the troubles in Northern Ireland. And to me, they're really gritty. And, and yeah, the violence is, is like, wow, that's enough. Um, but also really real. And I just wondered where that came from. Well, I, when I first moved down to London, I moved there in the early 80s when there was a big kind of Republican bombing campaign going on. And I used to sit and watch the news. I do it now, actually. I sit and watch the news now and think, I, I've got no idea what is happening here and why it's happening. And I used to, I, I spent a lot of time in Soho working in there. Um, not, in, not what you're thinking, Al. <laughs> doing voiceovers. Back to Albanian yeah. prostitute. Um, <laughs> And, and there was always a kind of air of threat and menace and you, know, you, you were never quite sure what was going to happen and when it was going to happen. And I used to watch these news reports and, and think, I've got no idea why this is happening and I, I want to find out about it. So I started reading about it and became kind of quite interested in the whole, all of the politics over there. Um, and, and, and through that, I wanted to try and I wanted. That's why I say the books are quite political as well, because I wanted to try and explore that through fiction and and you know certain things that people might not know about. Try and kind of shine a light on that. And then the second book as well. There's quite a lot. To, there's a few references to the law in Scotland and how it's changing and how you know um, they're trying to change the law in, in a way that um, that means. It's too, uh, uh, it's too complex to, com to, to explain, but my brother's a lawyer and I heard him having a conversation with someone about how they're trying to change it. And it's something that we would never hear about, you know, because it would just happen and then suddenly you'll appear in court and there's a thing where you can't, you're not allowed to admit that evidence because that's no longer allowed because the rules have changed, but nobody's told you. Um, and so there's lots of things like that that I'm trying to kind of highlight, um, you know, and the whole problem like with, Israel and Gaza, and I'm watching the news thinking, what is going on here? Why? There's, we've got to find out the history and why, why we're at this point in time where all these things are happening. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in that kind of thing. Um, and so the Northern Ireland thing, it was just to, to have that as a backdrop to, 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 to what was going on. Because, you know, if you've, read, if you've read it, you know it's not what the book's about. But I'm just kind of fascinated by it, really. I think I saw another hand up in the... Yes, down here at the end of the row. Over now. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, first one is, it's clear that acting doesn't now, if ever, 
a enthuse you as such, uh, and it's the writing that clearly uh, uh, floats the boat. It's why it took so long before you actually went into print, and it doesn't sound as if you were frustrated as an unpublished writer. It sounds like you decided to write, and it doesn't sound like there was years and years of rejection. So I'm curious whether it was just diversion because of other activities or its particular age was reached. It was why it took so long. That's the first question. Yeah. Second question, while I've still got the mic, is interested in the Woodhouse front, and it was why you took on such a, a huge role for what's a relatively short gig, as it were, mm. and it's an exhausting role, um, and it's whether it might have been easier because you may have been a Woodhouse enthusiast beforehand. Mm. So that's what the second question is. It was why you took that, that role on. Right. Uh, <coughs> we'll answer that one first and then go back to the first one or we'll answer the first one. Any first order is. I think it's your choice. Um, well, well, the first one, I think it took me so long but uh, um, just because people kept asking me to do things and I thought, well, I, but, but I, I, I have a thing where... I, if I haven't done something before, I think, well, I'd quite like to experience that and, and try it. And although I had experienced acting and acting in films, there's certain things come up where you think, well, that might be an interesting, just to, to explore that, that side of things. And, and, and I was kind of just a bit lazy about it all. I just never, I just thought, well, you know, that, that sounds like it might be quite interesting in some level, I'll, I'll give it a try. But, um, why it took so long is a very good question. Actually, I've just I've always felt so uncomfortable with it that it's I think it's age really. It's just um, getting to that stage in your life where you think, well, I'm going to start doing things the, the way I would quite like to do it rather than just doing what everyone. I've always felt that I've just been dragged through life by my hair. You know, thinking, oh yeah, if someone asked me to do something, yeah, that sounds okay. I'll give it a try. You know, um, and and with respect to the Woodhouse thing. I did, a, I did a play last year with a, a director called Sean Foley, um, called The Lady Killers, and the, it's not often you work in the theatre where you just really click with someone and really enjoy working with them and get, because his whole th approach to it is, it, in, a, in a funny way like mine, that if it's meant to be funny then he wants to go for the gag and, and try and make it funny. And I, I enjoyed working with him because there was a sort of freedom there. And when the Woodhouse thing came around, it was him that was directing it. Um, but it was, a, it, as I say, it was a very, very, right down to the wire. I was actually, I started rehearsals, and, and on, in the first week of rehearsals, I was on stage, and I had a moment where I thought, because at that point I knew I was going to be doing the third book, and I had a moment where I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to tell them I'm, I'm leaving, because I, I just can't do this anymore. Um, but how I've come to that point, why it's taken me so long, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not very sure. And the, I, with, with respect to reading Woodhouse, I, I've never read any PG Woodhouse at all. Um, so I think blind ignorance was probably <laughs> played a big part in the decision to, to do it. Because only since then people have said, well, what's it like to play such an iconic role? Um, well, the first question you say is, is this going to be the first, Scot first Scottish Jeeves? Uh, the, the first, that's the first question, and then the second one is, why? What is it like to play such an iconic role? Um, what would excite you about that role? Presumably, it wasn't playing Jeeves; it was the multiple role side of things. It was the multiple which role really got thing. You. Yeah. That's that's what that's what um, yeah, that's what that's what really interested me about it. One was working with Sean Foley, and and also it's not just playing Jeeves. That the, the there's three characters in the in the play. There's Bertie Wooster. There's Jeeves, who also plays um, um, Sir, Sir Watkin Bassett. He plays Gussie Finknottle. He plays Madeline Bassett. <laughs> and he plays Stiffy Bing. Um, so there's, there's five characters to, to play in the, 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 in the one play. And so that, I, I thought, well, I've never done anything like that before. So that might be, be interesting. Um, and you've survived so far. I've survived so far, but I, I, I said to my friends, if, if, if I collapse and die doing this, mm -hmm. please tell them I wasn't a happy actor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people say it was great because he died on stage and he's so happy with that. I would be so pissed off if that's how, if that's how my life ended. So you're all, you're all witness to that now. You that better get you off this before it's too late. Mm. Now, how about some final questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, a hand up here, second row from the back, I think. In the gloom. I'd like to 
keep your hand up. Marvellous. Thanks. Um, you've set the new book in Glasgow and uh, got into that as a setting. I just wondered how that squares with Glasgow's recent portrayal over two weeks of Commonwealth Games activities. Well, the, 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 what, I di what I didn't want to set out to do was portray Glasgow as a violent uh, town. You know, the, the drug dealing and uh, the stuff that happens happens in any major city. But the, the, as I say, the reasons for, for setting it in Glasgow were purely to do with the, this family, this young girl and her mother and her, you know, her grandmother finding somewhere that they would feel safe. So it, it was. It, I, I wasn't in any way trying to reflect what I think Glasgow is like. You know, it's just that these the things that happen just, you know, as I say, they happen in any major city, but just so happened that Glasgow was a setting. And 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 I I just I had the best two weeks a couple of weeks ago watching Glasgow on the telly because I thought it, it it just looked fantastic. It looked magnificent, and and it reflected the Glasgow that I know now because I although I live down south, my, my wife's from Glasgow. And I'm never away from Glasgow long enough to miss it. You know, I'm, I'm always back and forward with because her family's here and my family are here. And I still, when people say, "Are you going home?" I, I, I say, "No, no, I'm, I'm not going to Glasgow for a while. I'm, I'm down here." You know, I still think of Glasgow as home. So, um, uh, it would, it would never have been my intention to think to, to try and reflect Glasgow in that way or show Glasgow, portray Glasgow in that way uh, as a, you know, particularly drug-ridden or adult violent town, really. Um, but yeah, no, I thought, I thought it, was a, 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 it was just amazing. The last few weeks have just been incredible, really. Not just for Glasgow, but for the whole of Scotland. It just, it was, just, it was a, it, 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 it was quite, um, it was quite a nice thing to be down south. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. No, it is, to be down south and say, look, this is, this is our country, this is what we can do, it's amazing. Yeah. Time for one last question. Yes, here. Where's the mic? Quick, quick, quick. Mm. <laughs> We're only in the 100 metres final at the Commonwealth Games. I think you've lost half a stone since you started. <laughs> <laughs> now, where, uh, here we are. Hand up, gentlemen, here. Uh, good evening. Yeah. On the basis that an early part of your life seems to have come to be known as the latter-day Scottish play, um, can I ask whether you were disappointed or not not to be awarded the freedom of Cumbernauld? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mildly disappointed, actually. Um, no, I, 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 uh, yeah, maybe that might come. I was, when, when they knocked down the school, I, I, I said uh, mm. to one of the journalists, I, I was asked by a journalist about it, how I felt. And I said, well, I'm looking forward to the statue that they're, 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 <laughs> they're erecting. And then I get about three phone calls the next few days. Are they erecting a statue to you? I'm saying, no, no. <laughs> no, I wish I hadn't said that, you know. So if you read any, if you read any uh, stories about the statue that's going up, it's just it's nonsense. I, I made it up. But I think the knighthood's in the bag anyway. I would think so. Definitely. <laughs> but before you go to the palace, you've got work to do. You've got to sign copies of your books next door, which is out that door there, turn right, and then right again. It's been a lot, see some of you there. It's been a lovely session. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Tim Robbins. <laughs> <laughs>well, we've been to quite a few talks so far and it's actually been very good this year he made the audience laugh so i think that was the the best part of it he made everybody feel very relaxed i think it's great like i'm having a feast of books and i can touch them and see them and all these different sections and i really love them so it's a great place where to be i think the thing i appreciated the most was um when he said that when he writes about violence, he wants the reader to feel like he doesn't want to read anymore. And I thought these days it's important to keep that alive, you know, like about being human and what's happening in Gaza right now. I thought that, yeah, that's what I appreciated the most. I've um, been at the book festival a few times. This year seems to be the best, a lot more people than usual. I've seen quite a few things like Julia Donaldson and John Gordon Sinclair. It was very funny, not what I expected. Um, he's a very, very funny person. Very good. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing John Gordon Sinclair. Uh, he's talking about, uh, well, I've read one of his books. He's got a new one out and he uh, 
talked about both. It was really well chaired. He was very funny and extremely honest and uh, very interesting, both in terms of his ideas for the books and how he's uh, his writing style. Favorite part of the talk, I think, was was his honesty about his uh, acting profession and how he's uh, not really into being an actor, but how he loves being a writer and his new found world of being a writer is his uh, his his big thing in life.